So welcome everybody to our uh, club meeting here in January of a new year. It's been a while since we've done something like this, so it's looking forward to it. We've got a nice talk lined up for you with William. Uh, but first, before we get to that, we're going to go over just a few things on the business side. Um, with regards to the club, you know, of course, with COVID still going on, we're not doing any in-person gatherings. As you can see by our meeting here, uh, you know, the Foothill campus is still closed. So there's like no telescope viewing. Um, our Oak Ridge site is still open, of course, uh, for members who um, have access to that site. And uh, there's a checkout procedure and whatnot to make sure we can still do social distancing and keep keep that going. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can always talk to Rick Baldridge. He's our uh, chair for that. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, our, our get togethers have, we, we've done a few talks now over Zoom. Um, and I know, you know, someone just chimed in saying we should do more of this and we all totally agree so uh if anyone out there you know has an idea for a speaker or whatnot please you know send it to us send it to me or or to rick or or william and uh we can see if we can try to to line something up uh we're always looking for uh you know ideas for uh future speakers now tonight's meeting is a little special as well because it's our annual meeting and um Normally we do this uh, in person, of course, and we have voting and whatnot. We, we need to do the vote. It's a, it's a club requirement for a normal business uh, process. And um, so what we're doing this time around is we're going to do an electronic vote. So we're gonna be emailing all of our members. You guys will get an email uh, possibly later tonight and with instructions basically of how to vote. And it's gonna be simple. All you do is, um, Again, this is to uh, elect or re-elect board members to another two-year term, and uh, most of the board members are up for re-election this time around. So uh, it looks real simple. You just see the email, you know, the names will be on there. You can, uh, if you want to vote for everybody, just reply to the email to the address. That's, there'll be instructions in the email to tell you how to do this, but basically you'll send the email back and uh, record your vote. So. That is uh, the, the primary uh, purpose for tonight's meeting. Uh, we hope everyone who gets that email can reply back. Uh, the deadline uh, is going to most likely be Sunday night. So you have the weekend to do on it, but I suggest just send it back right away and be done with it. So that is all of our club business. So now Rick, I'm gonna pass it over to Rick Baldrich who will introduce our speaker. Everyone that has been in the club for the last 20 years or 30 years knows uh, William Phelps. He's been a board member for at least, well, how long, William? For the, it's been almost 30 years, right? Oh, we got you on mute. Yeah, 30 years, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah it's been, been very close to that. So William has done everything from uh, vice president to website uh, uh, designer. He's been our almost, uh, well, for many, many years, has been our one and only uh, Yosemite chairperson that has organized all the Yosemite events that we've had over the years, which have been an amazing event for everyone. And I know I, I can't say I've actually uh, stayed with him up there at Bridal Veil Campground on the Sundays when he does his famous pancake breakfast up there, but I've heard a lot of stories about it. And, uh, but I've been up there with William quite a few times for Yosemite uh, uh, days and uh, that the club's been doing. And hopefully we'll start those up again uh, this year. Um, so, uh, but yeah, William's done uh, some amazing work also up at Oak Ridge. He was the Oak Ridge chairperson uh, before I was uh, back a number of years ago. We got our toilet uh, set up there, which has actually been a big, big help to everyone that in the club and uh, has done a, 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 an amazing job just for almost every aspect of the club uh, that you can name. And so I'm going to introduce William. Again, he be, people know him very well. He's a uh, you forgot uh, the twelve. An, an excellent, uh, excellent astronomer. He does a lot of very highly varied things in the field of amateur astronomy. So, William, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. So we're going to talk about Arecibo tonight, and um, let me start the PowerPoint up and share it so you guys can get a look at it. Um, if there's any image problems or anything like that, um, feel free to set something up in the chat. Um, that's the easiest way to let us know what's going on. All right, there we go. You guys should all be able to see my first slide there. Um, that 
this little guy here is um, actually a, repro a, a reproduction of my name tag while I was there at Arecibo. I was there in 2004 as a guest of the SETI Institute, and it was pretty much the last time they went there. So when you go to Arecibo, it's of course in Puerto Rico, and, and the first thing you do is visit Old San Juan, and there's a military installation there. And so we did that. We went there first, and um, these are some quick pictures of the fort there. And um, it's really quite amazing and famous. And that's the streets of San Juan, very narrow, all cobblestone and brick. And then you head out of San Juan, and the first thing you see is this little sign here. And uh, it directs you to the entrance. And there's the first site of one of the towers, which of course are now all snapped off at the top. And getting a little closer, you can see two of the towers and the cables. And there is the gate. And there's a close up of the sign, and yours truly, right there at the entrance. So the first thing we did was we got checked in and they showed us the cabins. This particular cabin is not the one we stayed in, but it's a very famous cabin because if you watch the movie Contact, that's the cabin that supposedly um, so the Jodie Foster uh, character, Jill Carter, is who she was playing. That's the cabin that they lived in. Um, Peter Backus was living in that cabin at the time. This was our cabin. The accommodations are fairly simple, but comfortable. The interesting thing about Arecibo is that it has probably the fastest ethernet connection you've ever seen. <laughs> it is a, um, I forget the, the speed and the level, but it is, it's, it's like as high as it gets because people do a lot of remote observing. So it was blindingly fast. Um, near the gift shop and the visitor center at Arecibo, they have a, um, a planet walk and that's what we were looking at. Um, this is the start of it. That disc is the sun, and they have all, all of the planets at scale distance. Um, that's Robin Asimov there, and that's Seth Shostak and Steve Fanville, who is a PAS member who was along with us. I took this shot from the visitor center the first night. Um, really classic view of the, of the dish, and the, this is the catwalk up here. Um, a brief history of Arecibo. It was completed in 1963. There were major upgrades in 1970s, early 1970s. They upgraded the dish from a steel mesh to aluminum panels, which greatly increased both the sensitivity and the frequency response. And they added the first microwave or radar transmitter, the 420 kilowatt transmitter, which was actually down in the um, observing center. And you'll see in the pictures, there's a waveguide that carries that signal all the way up to the dish. In 1992 through 1997, there was a huge project, five years worth to, to add the Gregorian reflector and um, eliminate the use of the, um, the long antenna, which had all these little, um, <clears throat> little antenna elements for all the different frequencies. Um, by adding the Gre Gregorian reflector, they could have much more sensitive antennas, and you'll see that during the presentation. They also added a tall screen at the edge of the dish to um, reduce the noise and increase the sensitivity, and a one megawatt radar transmitter, which was installed up on the dish and added to um, all of this stuff, added to the load that the cables were carrying. In 2017, the um, facility was damaged by Hurricane Maria. It's pretty, there, there's, a lot of conjecture, but they're pretty sure that that's what put the biggest stress on the cables and caused them to start to fail. And then, of course, three years later, in August and November, the cables started unraveling and pieces started snapping. And on December 1st of this last year, it, it collapsed and fell to the ground. And that's pretty much the end of it. Okay, so the first thing we did was walk around underneath the dish. There you can see the 50-foot screen that was added that I just talked about. And these are aluminum panels. We'll get a closer look at those. Um, this is a, um, it's called a karst. It's a, it's a sinkhole, which is what enabled them to build the, um, the, the antenna there, the facility there. And um, these concrete blocks, you, can you guys can all see, every one of those is used to tune 
the angle of the dish. So every once in a while, they go around and they, and they use a laser and they tune the dish. Um, there's our interpret crew. And there's Steve Danville and Diane and a bunch of other people walking down underneath. There's another view that shows all the concrete blocks and the cables and stuff that are used to fine tune the, the angle. Imagine being able to fine tune the shape of your mirror, right? Um, and uh, this is one of the, there's three stations that are used to stabilize the dome. Um, there are motors that are, um, that pull on cables to control the tilt of, of the stuff up on the top, the structure that's suspended, not the dome, the suspension part. This is looking through the aluminum panels. That's how thin they are. I don't know if you've seen like the James Bond movie where the guy falls off the, um, the, uh, the old antenna and bounces on the dish, but um, you wouldn't bounce. You'd just go right through it. That aluminum is so thin. That's another uh, view through um, the hole in the middle. Um, and you can see the buckyball, the Gregorian antenna that was added there's a view just sticking our heads up. These sections here are put back in place to increase the, the antenna when they need to. Um, the section in the middle was open because they used to have to lower the antenna down and raise it back up again. The new one to change antennas in the old days, they had to lower the antenna down and stick another one on and pull it back up. And that was a very cumbersome process. This is my favorite sign at Arecibo. And I'm sure it has something to do with reminding people that when they drive underneath the dish, they're supposed to ground their vehicle. They're not allowed to drive anything down there that isn't diesel powered because the, the emissions, the electronic emissions from a regular ignition system would interfere with and, and possibly damage some of the equipment. But it's hard not to imagine that that sign is there because that's the last thing you'll see if you fall from the top. <laughs> Caution, ground, oh no. Anyway, I just, I, that one cracked me up. Okay, moving into the control room. This is what it looks like inside the control room, looking up at the dish. You can see some of the computers. Um, this is a, a, a display that shows where the dish is currently aimed and what the forces are on it and everything. During an observing run, this whole mechanism rotates around this, this U-shaped track right, and the ball, the Gregorian antenna gets moved. That's how they point the uh, telescope at different parts of the sky is by rotating that track and by moving this thing up and down. This antenna here is the old original antenna and it's now just a counterweight for the Gregorian antenna. So that's why it's still there. Um, this is the control room for uh, the equipment that actually operates the dish. And some of this is also SETI at home. There's a there's a rack in there that um, recorded signals. I think it's that one there. And it actually records signals on a piece of computer tape. And those tapes were mailed back to the US for processing. And I'll talk a little bit more about SETI at home when I get um, a little further into the talk. There's Mr. Banville. And this is the control for the 420 kilowatt radar transmitter, um, which I not sure is ever in use anymore. I actually don't know. Um, there we are. Look, oh, this is the SETI at home rack. Um, right there, that, that piece of equipment. Um, there is uh, Peter Backus and Steve. And so this is the equipment that SETI uses. Um, each of these is a computer. There were a whole bunch of them in a, um, in a uh, tractor trailer van. Um, and those were basically, that's what did their searching for ET. This is looking through a window, a wire mesh window. This is the 420 kilowatt transmitter. This is what high voltage, high power RF looked like back when this was built. This is quite a piece of equipment. All of this stuff is capacitors and things designed to create that 420 kilowatt signal. Um, Really, and that door was locked and you were not allowed in there because of the lethal voltages. If you were in there when they were transmitting, you'd get cooked. So um, it was very secure. There is one of the Klystron tubes. Those wow. things get rebuilt from time to time. This one has been sliced open so that people can see it. You can see there's sections cut out. Um, so it's just, a, it's just a few 
um, like a, but over there in the corner, you see the variance sign. That's that's the actual transmitter. Um, and this is a power system, general motor generator that runs it. Okay, this is a little meeting to discuss things. Um, this is uh, Jill Tarter right here. And that's of course Seth. I don't know who this gentleman is. He was the operator. This gentleman sitting back here was Baruch Bloomberg, who, if you don't know, invented the hepatitis B vaccine. And he was a guest of the SETI Institute, the same as, um, as I was. This is an actual, this is what an observing run looks like for SETI. These are waterfall displays. And what they're looking for is, is something that, that um, has a, a line in it that indicates that they've got a signal that's actually moving with the Earth's rotation. And that's what the, that's the basic thing they look for with that. Um, there's a picture of a waterfall display with nothing in it, and, uh, but it, that's, what the, that's what the SETI folks look at all the time. So here we go to the feed. This is the 420 kilowatt feed. Yeah, uh, let me talk about this for just a second. You see this antenna here. And again, as I said, that is the counterweight for the Gregorian reflector. Um, the interesting thing is that when they decided that they were going to leave that up there and use it, so as the Gregorian reflector moves out on this track, that would move out the same distance and, and so forth, and you can see the cables and things. Um, okay, somebody says more volume. Okay. Um, I'll try to talk louder. Is that better? Okay. Um, anyway, the... Um, the interesting thing about this is that before I went to Arecibo, I was a participant in SETI at home, like many, many other people. And you know, you, you look at SETI at home and you, and you sign up for it and they tell you, yeah, they're processing signals from Arecibo and all that stuff. What they don't tell you is that their signal is basically random parts of the sky because this thing is being used as a counterweight. And so wherever it points has nothing to do with aiming it at anything, it's just, being moved to counterbalance the Gregorian ball and stuff. And so it's just pointing at random parts of the sky, which is probably just as well, but they make it sound like it's like a targeted search and it's not, it's just random. There's our group just getting ready to go up. The hard hats are important. Um, when you go up on top of the dish, which, which we got permission to do one day, um, Seth was responsible for doing that. He probably got yelled at, but we got to go up there. Um, the hard hats get taken off the rack and they can't start the system back up and they definitely cannot transmit until all the hard hats are back. So that's how they keep track of that. It's like when you go to a power station or, or visit um, one of the generating facilities at a dam or something like that, they have the same system. So here we go up in the cable car. And this is one way to get up on top of the, the, um, the antenna, the structure, is to take the cable car up. Um, and that's on our way up. The view of the dish from, from up above. We're getting closer. Now you can really see the, uh, the old antenna. And um, oh, these radiators here. This is one of the few places where they make liquid helium. And that's what that's for. So um, there's another view of that antenna. This particular antenna, they're all the same length. There's several of them down on the ground, which are um, of course, the, the, the original dish reflected different frequencies, just like a telescope does at different places. And so they had different length antennas all the way up. Um, there's the, the he, uh, helium facility right there, a better view of it. And looking back, there's, you can see the, uh, the control room and the um, housing. And this is the housing, this is the cable car comes up from here. Um, those two vehicles are used by people that have to go down underneath and take things. Those are both diesel. Um, there is where the cable car arrives and we're getting off. And there is myself and Robin Asimov. And this thing behind us, that's the waveguide for the 420 kilowatt transmitter. And you can get a feeling for the size of those cables because that's one of the junctions where the cables come together, right? And those are the main cables. So they're like three or four inches in diameter. I'll talk about the liquid helium in a few minutes. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, 
I thought it was kind of interesting that there was this light up there. <laughs> anyway, there's a closer view of the where the tables come together. And um, notice the red paint here. That's because when you walk underneath this, you people hit their head on it. <laughs> so they put some red paint to call your attention to it. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is really symbolic now of, of what happened. That's one of the main cables that holds this 900 ton structure above the dish. And you can see what kind of tension that's under because that cable is like half a mile long and it sags maybe 18 or 18 inches or 24 inches, something like that. That's a lot of weight and it's gotta be a lot of tension to keep it from sagging very much. Looking back at one of the towers, one of the three towers. And again, you can see the main cable right there and then some of the smaller cables. And here's everybody walking underneath the weighted guide. Like I said, there's this little thing to remind you of not hitting your head on it because that would hurt. This is looking down at the main pivot in the center and all of the arms that radiate out to the structure. Um, there again is the, um, the original antenna before the, um, the Gregorian ball was installed, the Gregorian antenna system was installed. And here we are walking down the walkway to the center and inspecting the main pivot. It's a rather large bearing. Um, and there's steps in here that you can actually walk down through and that's how you get down to to go and look at the rest of the antenna system. So everybody walks down these little steps. <laughs> Caution, step up. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, but um, you don't want to get caught in this when it's turning, by the way, because it would probably cut you in half. And another view of this, all of the structure, most of this is aluminum beams because of the weight. And even then it still weighs 900 tons. There are the wheels, they're, they're basically train wheels that this thing rides on as it turns around and there's one of the motors that drives it um, and cans of grease because they have to grease these things periodically. And um, pictures being taken by people taking pictures. Now we're inside the Gregorian antenna. This is one of the reflectors. Um, the, the system that was added, there's three, well, it's a, three, it's a three reflector system. So the main dish and then two more. And what that does, there's one, there's the secondary antenna. And what that does is it brings everything to focus in a very small place. And so that allows them to have these little tiny antennas instead of that huge antenna. These guys are all, they're on a turret that rotates. And so they decide which antenna they wanna use and it rotates, it, get, it gets indexed to the, the uh, position where the signal arrives. And um, to reduce the noise on an antenna like this, they use liquid nitrogen normally, um, just like they do at Lake Observatory or anyplace else for CCD cameras. But here at Arecibo, they also have a, a, um, a couple of these things that can use liquid helium to cool them even more. Um, that's what the helium generator is for. There is um, one of the antennas and there's another antenna. You can see they're very different, right? Some of them are just these little cross pieces and some of them are coils. This one, um, I believe belongs to SETI, but I don't remember anymore. It's been several years, 20, 2004 was when this was taken. So, um, and this, you can see there's a pump here. That green thing is a pump that pumps liquid nitrogen in to cool um, the, the electronics here. This is the transmitter, the, four, the one megawatt transmitter. With a 420 kilowatt transmitter, it was way down in the control room and there was a big waveguide bringing it up to the dish. But this one is sitting on the ball itself inside the Gregorian antenna. So now we're looking at the catwalk. There's a visitor center. And there's a catwalk that goes out to the visitor center. And we can also again see one of the concrete towers, the top of which is now missing. And here you can see the visitor center itself. Um, there's this lovely sign, maximum capacity five people on the catwalk. And they have a um, they have a photo cell system that counts people. And when there's um, when it counts five people, then nobody's it, it, 
turns red, so there's like a traffic signal. You can see um, it would it would not be able to handle too many people. And then also over the catwalk is the 420 kilowatt transmitter waveguide right there, and some cables and things. Um, now the view back at the turning part of the dish. This is the piece that rotates around um, from the catwalk. And lots of cables and things holding all this stuff up. You see, there's this giant triangular frame um, that everything is suspended by um, or from. And then this is the part that rotates, and then that's the track. Yeah. One last view of the catwalk from further back. And my phone. Hush, where are you? Sorry, guys. Excuse me. There we go. And yours truly, this is about the end of my visit. And that's it. So I thought what I would do before we take questions is show you this video. So let me stop that share and start this share. If I can find it. Where are you? There you are. All right. So this. And I want it to be full screen. No, let's just do that. Okay. So this is a video of digital play. Yes. Hello. There it goes. So this is a video of a collapse. Every time I watch that, I can't help but my breath catches or something. Every time I see that cable slice through that catwalk, knowing that I walked on that catwalk once, and the, the cable just cuts through it like it was butter. The second half of this video is even more interesting. They happen to be flying a drone to inspect the cable at one of the towers when the cable failed. And I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine. I mean, that drone couldn't possibly have caused that cable to fail, could it? But who knows? Anyway, they they caught the actual failure of the cable to where they parted and let go. And you can see the cables already coming apart, the strands there, but there it goes. You can look, that's it. And whoever was operating the drone was good enough to be able to turn it around. And you can see the tower, the tops of the towers coming down. Pretty amazing. I think they were trying to assess the damage with the drone to decide how they would proceed with repairs and Obviously, that wasn't, or not actually, no, not repairs, but how to take it apart. They had decided to take it down, um, but then it took itself down instead. Anyway, so there we go. So that's the end of my program. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm happy to take questions. We can allow people to turn on their sound. And if you want, start while well, everybody can unmute themselves. I'll turn on, I'll enable you to start your video if you want. But not everybody turn your video on at once. Um, if there's any questions, you can also type them in the chat. What's the lowest elevation of the sky for aiming? I'm sorry, I wish I knew, but I don't know that. Um, Anybody else?
So where do you see this going in the future, William? Is there uh, any chance of there being an effort to try to rebuild a radio telescope here? I've heard conflicting opinions. Um, I don't think there's money for it. Um, I think that's what I heard the last thing around. But it, the Arecibo's been handed off so many times. Cornell had it, NSF had it. it it, it moved around. Um, I would be really surprised if they could come up with the funding for it, given you know what people have learned how to do with you know multiple small antennas and things like that, um, like what what SETI's doing at Hat Creek. But I really have no way of knowing. So um, good question. Thank you. Have you heard anything, Brian? Nothing consistent, but uh, aside from the new Chinese dish, I know of nothing that has the power or resolution of uh, this particular facility. I mean, especially when it comes uh, into the mapping of near Earth asteroids as they make a pass. And we just saw within the past few days uh, estimates that uh, um, Apophis may actually be posing more of a threat to us than had uh, previously been thought. Yeah. And being able to characterize very accurately uh, Apophis and its trajectory during its 29 apparition, you know, that would have been something that. Arecibo would have been invaluable for. And uh, it's probably way too much to think that any could anything could be in place by 29. But uh, there are lots of other NEOs that go scooting past us all the time. Yeah. And the ability of uh, Arecibo has, to this point in time, been unmatched. Yeah, it's really a shame. And um, there's somebody in the chat said that they'd heard that they were it had been underfunded for many years from a maintenance standpoint. There is a lot of, of information that points at the lack of maintenance as why the cables fail. Um, I have read that a couple, several times. And that's really a shame because it was such an amazing facility. It was unique and um, just, you know, I mean, it, it seems like it would have been preventable um, had they done, you know, whatever they needed to do. But there's also a lot of speculation that the hurricane put so much stress on it. Um, and the original design um, wasn't really intended to carry as much weight as got added to it over the years. Um, but they beefed it up quite a bit. So I don't know. We have a couple of people raising hands. Um, Ginger? Um, uh, yes. Um, I'm wondering if the funding is allocated uh, to rebuild it or replace it. I'm wondering if they would use the same location um, and maybe part of the funding could be justified as a um, infrastructure jobs creation for Puerto Rico. Yeah, certainly could. Um, yeah, the, the, it's certainly, I mean, there were, you know, there weren't that many people, but the construction certainly would hire you know, would, would hire a lot of people because. And um, I'm also wondering if newer technology um, might make it um, a much better um, telescope and maybe even design in a way to rapidly lower it and store it for hurricanes. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? That was a pretty unique location though. The, the, um, the karst sinkholes um, created a natural place for that antenna. Well, you can't really appreciate how big it is. One of the traditions that we had um, is when SETI was observing, they plan their observing because the, the cables wrap, you can only turn the thing 720 degrees and then it has to stop and unwind. And so most observing programs that like SETI's where they want to look at different targets across the sky, they, they sort everything. The, the computer software that runs the, the dish sorts everything into you know, right ascension order or whatever. And um, so the thing would take, you know, would point to a target and, and collect some data and then it would move and collect some data and it would move and collect some data. 
And then at the end of a couple hours, it would reach the 720 degree point and the software, the command software that ran the main antenna would then, there would be like a horn that went off and everything would stop and the thing would unwind. And it took just under 30 minutes for it to go back around. The tradition is that you walk out in the middle of the night and stand under the dish while it's doing that. And I can remember doing that several times and you're surrounded by the sound from these tiny little frogs, these coquis, and it's almost deafening. I've got a recording somewhere I should try to play. So we have another question from the DeVivos. Hi, William, it's Judy. I just, I'm not that familiar with this scope. I just was wondering what remarkable accomplishments came from it. Oh boy, there's, Brian, can you help out with that? I mean, I know that they, they, they did radar on Venus, yeah, well, um, there are a few things that, from a planetary standpoint, I can talk to. From astrophysics, it's done, of course. I mean, its main role has probably been in astrophysics, no doubt about it. It's been uh, just tremendous there. But from a planetary standpoint, I can say that uh, bi-static experiments using Arecibo were very instrumental in detecting ice at the poles of the moon. Mm, that's right. So by using circular polarization ratios, determining that the lunar polar ice was not necessarily limited to permanently shadowed areas, but actually extends out into areas that sometimes get sunlight and are perhaps just a few centimeters down. So that ice actually quite likely exists as permafrost in areas of the polar regions of the moon even outside those areas that are permanently shadowed. It was also used to uh, discover the presence, amazingly strange though it sounds, of water ice in permanently shadowed craters at the poles of Mercury. Mm -hmm. Hot, as hellishly hot as Mercury is, there are even bigger deposits of water ice in the craters at the poles of Mercury. And perhaps most importantly for the well-being of you and me is the fact that uh, when we have these periodic approaches of near-Earth asteroids, the power of Arecibo to be able to send out a pulse of radio energy to serve as radar mapping and then the large diameter of that dish to get high resolution of the returned pulse well, it allows us to map and characterize the nature of these asteroids as they pass us. So those are just a few things from a planetary science standpoint. But I will readily admit that the planetary science standpoint that I'm familiar with is probably vastly outweighed by the work that this dish has done in the area of astrophysics. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I was um, gonna mention that one of the things I discovered in my, in my research was that um, the resolution of the, um, the one megawatt transmitter and Arecibo, they could see an object the size of a golf ball at the distance of the moon. That's pretty impressive. Uh, uh, Brian, can I add something to the pl planetary science? Can you hear me? Yeah. I, uh, when I was a child, uh, when I was in, in grade school, it was believed that the uh, rotation of Mercury was 88 days, the same as its uh, revolution around the sun. And I remember reading a long time ago that uh, Arecibo was involved in discovering that the actual rotation of Mercury on its axis was 59 days. So that was another planetary discovery that Eris was involved in. That's very cool, Steve. Thank you. You're welcome. But somebody asked how it was that I got to be at Arecibo in the first place. And um, it's actually one of my favorite stories. Um, back when I was um, working at IBM, there was this big scandal with the United Way 
and um, all of us that that worked at IBM and, and you know we were giving a certain amount of money every you know when our out of our paychecks to the United Way, and um, I got you know we found out that like forty two percent of that money was going to the executive salaries and stuff like that, and it was this whole big scandal. So I decided that I would stop that and manage my my contributions myself and you know Red Cross and so forth. And as I was looking around, I stumbled into SETI Institute's plea for, because they had just lost their funding from NASA, they'd lost funding from whatever. And so they had started up a thing called Team SETI. And um, if, you, if you started contributing some money, you became a member of Team SETI and you got a little badge and everything. And I just happened to be Team SETI member number six. And years go by and every year they have a drawing and every year they go to Arecibo and somebody gets their name drawn and they get to go. And I've never won anything in my life. And I won that drawing for the last trip to Arecibo with SETI Institute. That's how I got to go. Now, when I got there um, and I met Jill Tarter and I'd already known um, um, Peter Backus, um, who was actually a member of PAS at the time, Jill Tarter has got to be one of the most amazing people, scientists I've ever met. You know, a lot of people that you meet in those kinds of positions won't give you the time of day because you're just an amateur astronomer. She doesn't have that attitude. And there's a whole separate story about professional astronomers not looking through telescopes that you guys all know and all that stuff. Jill is not one of those people. And so we got there and the first thing she did was teach us how to operate the system and how to actually operate the SETI program observing run. And then Steve and I took it over and we just took turns running the whole thing. And she went off and said, I'll go do my email and you guys got it. <laughs> that was incredible. So we were actually observing from Arecibo for a couple of nights. Biggest telescope I've ever used. Anybody else? Awfully quiet. All right. Shall I turn it back to you, Gary? William, real quick, any plans to uh, go to China and try and uh, compare what you saw at Arecibo with uh, what's operating there? No. No. <laughs> China is probably the last place I want to go right now. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that thing is huge, right? It's a lot bigger. All right. Uh, any more questions for uh, William? If not, just a just another reminder that uh, again, the, you'll get an email. Club members will get an email uh, later tonight or or tomorrow morning uh, with instructions on how to return it for making your vote for the board members. So please, we ask if you could very much spend the five minutes and. Get that email sent back to us, please. We would very appreciate it. And uh, other than that, I think uh, we're done. William, we done? I'm done. Let's say we have any more questions. No, thank you, William, for the talk. That was great. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank that you, William. Really You're very welcome. Thank you. Great talk, William. Thank you. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. It's really was interesting the memories that came up putting the slideshow together yeah fantastic thank you and i like i said boy watching that that cable slice through that catwalk that gets me every time <laughs> <laughs> yeah very sad yes very sad all right folks good night everyone jake have a good evening <laughs>